we've kind of closed the open bar and people are scrambling for their wallets. I want to return like them to a visa system that is for international students, which is based on excellence. And I'm not naive to think that xenophobia doesn't exist in Canada, but sometimes we don't help our own arguments. Hi, and welcome to The Missing Middle. I'm Kara Stern. And I'm Mike Moffat. And today, we're really excited to welcome Mark Miller, Canada's Minister of Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship. But before we get to that conversation, don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you. Welcome, Minister. Thank you so much for joining us and being the first federal politician on our podcast. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Thanks, Kara. Appreciate being on. So you recently announced that there would be for the first time targets for temporary immigration. And I mean, we want to get into why that hasn't happened before. But let's start with the numbers, which is that the temporary resident population of Canada as a percentage was 6.2% in 2023. And the goal is to get it down to 5% in 2027. So that's a decrease of 19%. And I wanted to clarify that while many people think of temporary residents generally here as part of the temporary foreign worker program, that's only actually 9% of temporary temporary residents. The rest are made up of international students, people here on postgraduate work programs and asylum seekers as well. So why is such a huge decrease in temporary residents necessary? Well, I I think we've seen in, in, in the last short few years, a jump from Two plus percent of the population to, to to something that is as high as six point two, six point three. It actually may be higher because we the reference here is twenty twenty three, and there have been some significant arrivals from Ukraine since then, uh, and then arrivals in terms of students as well. So the number is probably slightly higher, uh, and therefore the decrease will be about you know nineteen twenty percent perhaps even a touch more. So re- really significant. I think uh, looking at what we've all been looking at, at least those that are initiated to it, economists, um, thought leaders, Mike, uh, and others, you know, the impact of the, the impact of people that are here on a temporary basis on what's generally defined, uh, for most people in, in a sort of a nebulous way is the cost of shelter, the price of housing, um, price of rent, uh, in an area that has grown and the, the, what that driver is, is a lot of people uh, that need a roof over over their head. It comes from a lot of areas. Affordability is, is a catch-all for a lot of things, including the rather significant increase of in, in interest rate. But when it comes to this particular indicator and driver, uh, a very significant number of people that are here in this com- country, mostly legitimate reasons uh, and some very compelling humanitarian reasons, uh, but nonetheless, uh, one factor in driving up affordability. So we thought it was the right thing to do. Uh, we thought signaling to Canada, Canadians and and the market and those that look at it carefully when they take other decisions, particularly those that have control over interest rates, um, would be an important message to send. But more importantly, getting that done will be the next challenge over the next little while. We need to do it right. Uh, we have a number of economists not always agreeing with each other, but have said that we have to get it done the right way or we will actually exacerbate a problem that we're trying to fix. So it's not going to be easy by any stretch of the imagination, but it's something we thought needed to be done. Signaling 5% was very important. I personally think getting there is even more important, but that's the discussion for the next couple of months with, with, uh, with the provinces and territories. We were wondering why, like, it makes sense to me that we're here, we're hearing a lot about this nowadays, but there have been people pointing this out. I know Mike's one of them who have been talking about this being a problem for years now. So what took so long to actually start taking action on this? I mean, I, I think politicians are at their most miserable when we undertake, in, and we can be miserable in a lot of areas, but when we undertake revisionist history. And so, I, you know, I, I don't want to go back and say, you know, look, what we did great and this is what we thought about. And, it was the right decision at this point in time. I think, you know, in fairness, when you look at some of the challenges that we were facing through COVID and coming out of COVID, I think much more significant ones that largely have been resolved. Um, we have a labor market that is constricting in, in a number of areas. Um, the shortages are more sectoral. They're structural ones that don't necessarily need larger inflow of people, particularly on a temporary basis, which 
comes with a lot of unintended and sometimes intended consequences. So I think the time was right. Um, and also the impact of seeing, you know, large increases that, uh, we hadn't necessarily planned for uh, large public policy decisions on uh, welcoming Ukrainians. No one, I don't think anyone should fault Canada for doing that. I think it was the right thing to do. Um, Syrian refugees, Afghanistan, uh, decisions in and around students where we trusted provinces. Yes, the federal government has a role. Uh, perhaps we should have seen this earlier, but clearly this is a point in time to, to make those decisions in in the context where uh, everyone is absolutely feeling the affordability crunch. And I think that that is an important factor in making those decisions now, and it's, it's why I took that with my with my team. And um, the challenge now, and as in all things government, is to get it done. Well, well, thanks, uh, thanks, Minister, for, for coming on. I really appreciate having you here, and, and congratulations on these changes. Because I I don't think Canadians realize how potentially transformative they are for good or potentially for ill because by my math i think that we're going to see you know population growth levels which have been over a million people a year down to about three hundred thousand overnight if, if i'm getting the math right and again if i'm getting the math right we're looking at uh, the total number of non-permanent residents uh going from about 2.6 to 2.1 million or so so a, a reduction in absolute numbers at about half a million or so. So where do you expect this decrease to come from? Like which which category, what's the sort of pathway to get us there in, in three years? The answer is, this is it, it's really one that we'll have to figure out with provinces. I mean, I have announced, and maybe we'll have to do more, uh, a policy of no new net growth with international students. We, I've also announced a number of of measures to uh, the postgraduate work permit system, particularly with respect to spouses or eligibility of certain institutions for postgraduate work permits. Um, but we'll have to do more than that if we're going to achieve the goals that, uh, that, that, that I announced a couple days ago. Um, is there more work to be done in that area? Certainly. I think some of the solvency criteria, some of the measures to bolster the robustness of, of the system itself will naturally contribute to that. I think self-discipline among, let's hope, self-discipline among uh, postgraduate institutions will contribute to that. If that gets out of control, we'll have to kind of take another look at it. Uh, that may be a further announcement in the fall if everything, um, if things don't go the way we hope that it goes. I think in, and this is the area that we don't necessarily control, but when it comes to our humanitarian responses, we can't really know how the war in in Ukraine will go. And I don't think anyone will forgive us for sending people back. So there's kind of some numbers that are hard to change there. Um, but I think in areas in the international mobility program, looking at our postgraduate work permits, looking at some of the criteria that we have for labor market impact assessments and tightening up those criteria, largely to attack very similar areas that deal with the integrity of the systems rather than the volume that is generated. And although volume is a product or a byproduct of lack of integrity in systems, um, are ones that I will be looking at with my teams to suggest those to provinces, but I think we'll have to see solutions from provinces as well. That's sort of the inflow of this and describing, and Kara mentioned it, describing this, understand, Canadians understanding exactly what composes the pie chart of people that are here temporarily is probably 90% of the challenge. Um, but then the more important action oriented steps that we need to take will be, will have to be ones that are tailored to the economy that we have and the economy that we want to see. Um, but also how we deal with people that are here temporarily. I, I call it the outflow of people. So do we tell provinces you have lots of responsibility under your provincial nominee program? Uh, if you really want these people in the country, well, take responsibility and make them permanent residents. Um, Let's look at some as opposed to always looking abroad for more people and the rather significant permanent levels we have more domestic draws for a basin of people. So I'm, I'm speaking for English right now, uh, a group of people that, uh, that, that are, that are young, that are able, that have perhaps gone through an educational system for, for three years and are sort of climatized to Canada perhaps give them the opportunity to become permanent residents. So that deals with, in part, the outflow. Um, it reduces people from, um, from from the numerator and adds to the the, de uh, the denominator. So that, that helps in, in a number of ways. 
lots of ideas, but I think it's not necessarily up to Mark Miller and the federal government to decide. I think we have to have that, that sit down and a real discussion with provinces, because even in provinces where, where I've heard, such as my own, in Quebec, that they want to decrease the number of temporary residents quickly when you break down the categories and get sophisticated about it, there's kind of like this whoa, whoa approach. Don't touch them and don't touch them, don't touch them. So it needs to be an honest conversation with my with my colleagues in provinces that come up to me and tell me how much they need people uh, as well as industries. So that'll be Mike, something to follow over the next little while. Um, I also just wanted to mention, because of course we know that there, you talked about people from Ukraine and what's going to happen there. Obviously we don't know what's going to happen with the war in Gaza and whether we'll see some uh, people coming in from there. Like we know that's a big conversation. I just want to acknowledge it because I know it's not exactly what we want to get into in this conversation, but it felt like we should at least acknowledge that that's a conversation that you're having right now. Um, but it's been two months since the announcement of the two-year cap on international student visas, and many of the universities and colleges in Canada, especially in Ontario, where there's been like huge numbers of international students, they're facing fi uh, substantial financial insecurity. And a lot of them are saying that this is why. It's because of this change and because, of course, they had their tuition frozen for a while. Does it concern you that they may not be able to afford con to continue as things are? It does. Absolutely. And I really don't want to sound cavalier about this, Kara, but we've kind of closed the open bar and people are scrambling for their wallets. And I, that that is the undeniable reality uh, of it. Um, it doesn't mean that I'm sympathetic to the reality of it. Uh, the, our, our, our stellar international education system, the our education system in Canada that we attract international students to was not originally based on international students. It's the reason people come here. Um, and I think that is something we need to return to. Uh, my announcement will probably not bring us back to the excellence that I'm preaching for, but I think it is something where we'll it'll provide that space for universities, colleges, um, and even private colleges to have a discussion about how they uh, leverage an international visa student uh, program that has been bolstering balance sheets in some cases unnaturally. And, and I talked a lot, I've talked a lot about fraud. I've talked a lot about, uh, in, in colorful terms about this, but there is a real discussion to be had about the proper financing of post education system, post secondary education system across Canada, but in the case at hand in, in Ontario, Ontario's come to the table with some money. Is it enough? That's a discussion they need to have with their college universities that they have jurisdiction over. Um, but we, you can't artificially buoy a system that's been undernourished on the backs of international students who sometimes have had their families pool together money for them to get uh, what they believe to be the best and brightest education often are not are not getting that. Uh, it isn't fair. Again, uh, undeniable that uh, any decision has impacts. And that's why I've tried to be as careful with the students that are currently here who are entitled at the very least to their dignity, um, but also to a quality education to be able to do that in a way that doesn't stigmatize them, particularly when a number of them come from one particular source country. So that's, you know, yeah. it's a real social issue that we have to have a conversation about. But again, provinces need to be at the table on this. Uh, I know Mike has been highlighting this for years and, and it starts with a very basic issue about how colleges and universities are properly funded. It seemed to surprise a lot of the universities that they didn't expect to see this coming. How um, how long had you did it take you from the time that you came up with this idea to implement it? Like, why wasn't there kind of that discussion with them over the over the time? Because this problem is not new, right? It's been going on a while. No, I, and did people get proper notice? Uh, it's disingenuous to suggest no one saw it coming. Uh, Sean Fraser, my predecessor, had been warning for a long time, a number of inst we've been working with institutions on the recognized institution model. In order to work on that model, you need to identify the problem and justify it to them and had large buy-in. I think perhaps people thought that was the only measure we would take. When I, when I was asked to serve in this position shortly after that, I, I did see that crazy demographic curve of international students going up to 1.4 million if we didn't deal with it. And thought immediately about our levels planning, which was taking place at the same time and saying, you know, those people are not necessarily all going home. Some do, most don't. Uh, we would have created our own homegrown um, asylum crisis in Canada if we had not taken more radical action. I, BC, in fairness, had started to do some work, but largely unheeded in, in uh, everywhere else of concern, including in Ontario. And so this is something we needed to announce. At the point when you take a decision like that, knowing that it'll have repercussions and people will tend to game it, 
you do have to, with, with, with some exceptions, be quite quiet about it once someone pulls the trigger and you decide when to announce it. So um, that's just the reality of, of, of making sure people don't game a very lucrative multi-billion dollar proposition that has had people chasing short-term gain without looking at the long-term pain. So I, I do question I do question the proposition that people were blindsided by it because they absolutely weren't. Yeah, so Alex Usher and others in the higher education sector have noted that there's a lot of regulatory uncertainty now, particularly among the students themselves about whether or not they'll get in, whether they'll be eligible to get the postgraduate uh, work permits when they graduate. And that may be preventing students from applying to Canada. So might we even suggest, uh, see uh, enrollment numbers and the number of international students fall even faster than this plan would suggest? Yeah, and it could be Mike. It's my big concern about this year. My obviously concern at the initially was people gaming the system. So we put in a bunch of parameters to to make sure that that didn't happen, including including freezing the the the, the visa issuance system for um, up, up till March thirty first until provinces got their letter of attestations out. Um, that's still ongoing in some cases. Um, but I, I guess when you look at metrics, what you don't want to do is base your metrics off uh, turbulence in the system that is not intended to, to, to last. Uh, same concern that I had with respect to the uh, the decisions taken by the Modi regime to uh, to kick some of our folks out of the country. Um, I didn't need my international student problem solved by, by a decision of a foreign power. We needed to take the ones that would be consequential and would be would last throughout the cycle that we're, that we're regulating for, in this case, a couple, a couple of years. Um, no doubt this will perhaps be made permanent once we settle on something. Right now, I think the turbulence is created by the provinces taking the difficult decisions as to which institutions are rewarded uh, and which institutions, unfortunately, well, let's hope in some cases, have to be shuttered. And, and I think that is, that, that is the great uncertainty that exists. I hear from institutions as well and colleges about uh, about the international reputation to Canada. Not unconcerned by it, uh, but prior, I think there's some willful blindness there as well. Uh, the reputation of Canada was that this was a way to be used as a backdoor entry into Canada. And I think that's sort of unappreciated by those particular institutions. I want to return like them to a visa system that is for international students, which is based on excellence. Yeah, and I, I think that institutional uh, or, or our reputation as a country is, is so important. We don't want to see institutions taking advantage of that. And I'll note that, you know, you've repeatedly called out what you characterize as bad actors in the higher education space, and, and there certainly are some. But I want to know what, what you think about the, the institutions who've seen just the biggest overall growth in the number of international students, because they're, you know, international, they're community colleges in Ontario who don't have public private partnerships for the most part. They're, you know, fairly standard institutions. How much of a responsibility do they play for this? You know, are, would we consider them bad actors? Um, you know, what is your view on, on these institutions in Ontario that have seen such rapid growth over the past few years? Yeah, I mean, quantitatively, Mike, you're right. It, it, they are they are significant. Uh, if you if you if you look at one of the, if not the, I won't uh, hard for me to say uh, when my alma mater is McGill. But if you look at one, one, if not the top institution in Canada, in, in the University of Toronto, they have had a very it is a billion dollar proposition. Um, has there been an unhealthy ecosystem created at the University of Toronto? Perhaps in some cases, yes. Uh, I look at their their outgoing number of asylum seekers associated with that particular institution. Uh, it says to me that they are recruiting a quality type of student that doesn't um, then claim asylum. I don't want to denigrate anyone that claims asylum, but it can't be on the back of a poor education or three years in Canada with presumably sufficient amounts to live here, thrive, and perhaps even get a permanent residency. So um, if you look at some of the colleges that have been uh, perhaps almost adopting a, a a for-profit motive, at least if you look at their balance sheet. Um, I don't know how I characterize them, but it certainly isn't, I don't think, serving the, the, the students that they have attracted to bolster those balance sheets. Um, for my own credibility, I have to deal with some of the more egregious breaches of, or at least abuses of the international visa program. That includes those that have 
committed fraud or fly by night operations, um, you quickly get to a point where you exhaust the volume and have to attack other 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 uh, aspects of in institutions that perhaps do need to be reduced. And that's I have my opinions on on them. Uh, I think it is really the place of provinces to to act based on that. And you know, in my mind, if they can create the space without for people to have the good student experience, for people to have proper housing without impacting the students that they need to attract locally. That's not what I call a, a bad actor. Um, that usually comes with a reduction in volume, though. So I think some of them are really going to have to have their, their come to Jesus moment and, and, and reduce the volume, even though they don't have necessarily bad institutions and they, they do serve the, the marketplace well afterwards. I've, I've heard lots of arguments about how indispensable some programs are to um, the work sector, but, you know, the best way to convince me is to prove that and to work with the province in question to prove that so that people can demonstrate that they're worthy of a postgraduate work permit and the transition into into permanency here. So let's uh, let's transition over to the uh, work discussion and particularly temporary foreign workers. And, you know, as Kara mentioned that, you know, they are you know, about nine percent of, of this group. So it's small, but still meaningful. Um, back in, in 2014, 2014, when Stephen Harper was prime minister, uh, Justin Trudeau criticized the federal, federal government for the number of temporary foreign workers in the country and said it was keeping wages down. Now, today, the number of uh, TFWs is substantially higher than it was back then. So so how did we get to this place over, over the last decade? You know, in I guess in number of ways, I mean, these are, these are sectors that have increased. There's no there's no question about that. I, I have, I'm hesitate particularly in this in this market of price inflation with respect to food to to start pointing fingers. Um, but there's no question that there is uh, in, in these low wage streams um, a tendency at times to push down wages, although this, these are not necessarily jobs that Canadians fill. I mean, it's quite clear and they were quite odd peculiar to be very polite attempts to fill those positions when people weren't coming in during COVID and certain provincial premiers were trying to send students to the fields, which seems like it comes from another country, but you can, you can Google those articles where there were those suggestions. Um, so hard to say that you're driving wages down when the market isn't there. Uh, but there are areas where, where on, on the whole, there is a negative downward trend. And I think this is a conversation that, I have to have with my colleagues that that um, you know in provinces that 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 want to want to have more workers that are temporary. Um, there needs to be a discussion about the impact on and the, and, the, and the market impact on that. The data we have federally is is incomplete. Uh, it, it is sometimes indicative of trends, and it's something I think we need to have a better conversation about. Uh, I think in the labor market impact assessments, what we see is a need to rethink that in a number of ways. Randy Boissonneau, my colleague, announced one or two of the ways, which I think is a beginning, but I think we have to attack the fraud in the labor market impact assessment, which in some places is rampant um, and creates these uh, these opportunities to drive down local wages, particularly when that labor pool is increasing domestically. You know, no one wants to see a situation of, I think it was a the Bank of Canada, the Royal, the RBC kind of temporary workers that, which is clearly a, a scandal and should not, not have occurred. Um, we have to continue to remain vigilant on that and um, not immune to that criticism when we when we don't do it well. If we look at companies that received a positive labor market impact assessment, like there are still ones that are really surprising. I noticed that like there are two McDonald's and two KFCs in Toronto that are using temporary foreign workers. And I keep thinking like, those are jobs that, you know, if they raise their wages by a dollar, like they're probably competing against places paying minimum wage. Like that would get people to want to work those jobs who are here, right? So why are those companies still allowed to take part in the temporary foreign worker program? You know, it's a question, it's a question, Kara, that I have. Uh, the, the argument you'll hear from 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 lobbyists and from the the, the the businesses themselves is that you know franchisees have certain margins that they expect and when they increase by I mean you both have heard the argument before I'm telling you I'm not telling I'm simply telling you to, to, to simply saying it to, to tell you that I've heard it as well um, and not to pretend that it doesn't exist but um, 
the threat that you hear is that these places will be closed down, closed down and that there is a de definite is that market. A problem? Um, probably not in some, in, in some ways, uh, it, but it creates more uncertainty. It creates uh, the type of, um, of reaction that, that you typically hear from, from people about their, uh, their local Tim's or, or whatnot is that somehow we are, we are shutting down business, but I, in some cases, this is perhaps a risk that we need to take. Um, and, and, and sometimes we have to have a conversation with industry about, about wages and, and the need to, um, to make sure that they represent the level of work that's being put into it and the opportunities that are being presented to, to Canadians. Um, I just met with the union, UPA, which is the, the Quebec union of agricultural, um, producers. And they noted, obviously the, something that is true, which is that the wages in, in, in the area have doubled over the last rather short period of time. And so is that contributing to, to food inflation? These are conversations in our country that I think is, they're worthy to have. I don't necessarily have the answers to them, but they do go through and by the, the nature of the people that we are hiring in this country, whether they come from abroad or from here. There's another area that I think about where I notice a lot of people are coming to work in, or there's a lot of applications and acceptances for places that do childcare and daycare. And that's something that like we need desperately more childcare spaces, especially with the $10 a day program being implemented. Like people are having a hard time finding spaces. So I understand the need for that, but these are low wage jobs and the fact that they're hard to fill, especially because they require a couple of years of schooling, like maybe they shouldn't be such low wage jobs. And I wonder like why allow companies to increase the supply of those low wage workers for those jobs that we absolutely need instead of raising them to a point where people who are here actually want those jobs. And I, I, you know, I don't think you'll, f I'm not going to provide you any counter argument to that, Kara. It's, it's, it, you're right. Uh, the, the challenge is to find the right people. I have the particular challenge of trying to find, uh, the same people in, for French communities outside Quebec, um, because the, the day, you know, teachers and qualified people that take care of our most important assets and kids is, is something that, I need to focus on, and it's the same dilemma that we're facing. We'll, uh, hopefully, those you know we can partner with people to make sure that these people are getting properly paid. Uh, so too in the in the caregiver space, which has been um, subject to a lot of criticism, uh, and does have its origin in, in, in one or two source countries. But again, all these all these are all these are opportunities, and I think opportunities to have a conversation as, as a society about how we treat our most vulnerable and most important people, and that's sometimes a really, really important, important conversation that um, goes through some very basic questions about how we pay the people to take care of them. Yeah. And, and I think you and, and, and Kara have identified something important here that when we look at temporary foreign workers, you know, there's a variety of, of different areas, you know, from folks in the ag sector and we worry about food inflation, uh, folks in the, the daycare, early childhood education sector, and you worry about the $10 daycare. I worry a little bit less about getting my shamrock shake at McDonald's, but others may vary there. So, you know, what what can we expect to see in a reduction in the number of temporary foreign workers? Like, are, are we going to sort of focus on industry? Like, And are those, you know, how big are those reductions going to be? Are we going to get back to the levels of a, of a decade ago? So, I, you know, a little unclear yet, Mike. I think this is a conversation that uh, that will be ongoing with 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 principally Randy uh, and, but also also all the people that are going to come see us in the next couple months after they've heard this this announcement. Uh, and Randy did take a decision about reducing sort of the three to ten ratio down to two. Sorry, um, who's Randy? Randy Boissonneau, who is in charge of uh, who is with me in the announcement on on Thursday and is responsible for some of the measures that we need to take in the temporary foreign workspace, which you said is only a few percentage points of, uh, of the temporary resident um, pie chart that we were talking about, but it is, uh, it, it is an important area that is regulated outside my department, which is why I was mentioning him. Um, but the measures that he took, one of the measures that he took, on Thursday was to announce uh, a reduction in some areas from three to 10 workers, a, a ratio of temporary, uh, temporary workers to, to, to non-temporary. Um, but that's still above the pre COVID measure. So I think we have to take it to Mike's point. We have to take a look at what was working pre COVID, what wasn't working 
and how we adjust that carefully, knowing that industry has adjusted in, as a result. The last thing I want to ask you about is it seems like the consensus on immigration in this country has really broken. And many people are now pointing to immigration as contributing to the housing crisis and to, to not being able to find a family doctor or long waits at the hospitals. We know we've gained a lot of benefits from immigration, but it seems like the I guess the pace of it has come at a huge social cost. And what responsibility does your government take for that change in that consensus? I think an important part of it, there, you know, it's frustrating to see that, uh, you know, and, and it's, you know, you see it in other countries. Um, so we're not immune to what we, what we're seeing in Europe, what we're seeing principally to our part in, in the U S or part of the South of us, which, um, you know, simply is Canadians who can't be blind to, uh, I don't think the consensus is broken. Um, I think it's fragile. And I think to some extent as a country, we've gotten lazy about it, including, uh, including at, uh, at government levels. I talk, I talk to tons of people about the importance of, of immigration. They talk to me about the importance of it. Uh, chambers of commerce, industry, individuals, families. Uh, and I, obviously I talked to a lot of uh, asylum seekers and refugees, uh, but we don't go out and sell it to each other. And so, um, I do get poll upon poll about negative attitudes. I sometimes get surprised by it. I, it, it, it whether, which province it's more prevalent in than others, even though despite the political rhetoric, um, Quebec still seems quite open to immigration. It's kind of an interesting counterpoint to what you see in the political arena. Uh, but it, it, it's frustrating to see. And I think any study that we do sh in any depth shows that there are still positive attitudes towards immigrants and immigration. But the frustration comes with the issues that you raised, not only affordability, but access to education, access to uh, access to the healthcare system, um, and the failure of governments to get sort of organized. And people don't want um, unorganized immigration. The resistance, even though you can have a lot of arguments about irregular migration, Canadians understand regular migration and they even understand regular refugee resettlement. What's very hard to square sometimes is people arriving at airports in vast numbers and claiming asylum or crossing the border in an irregular fashion, knowing that a number of those people have, are truly uh, escaping war and famine. It's just the sociological phenomenon of people just getting frustrated with that is there. It sometimes comes from diaspora communities as well. Uh, so that exists. And I think we have to have a car. I think we can have a reasonable conversation as a society about these things. I think we can reasonably disagree. And my job in the position that I have is to bring people together one and not take decisions that'll make things worse. Ideally make decisions that show that we are a responsible government, that we are dealing with generational things and not sort of, um, political electoral cycle things like the demographic curve, like the other side of the equation that we f always forget to mention, which is the importance in the sectors that you highlighted of immigrants themselves in the healthcare sector, uh, physicists, chemists, uh, pharmacists, all predominantly staffed nurses, uh, all f f predominantly staffed by, by immigrants and the value that they contribute to things like the healthcare system, which are a key element of Canadian identity itself. And sometimes we do fail to talk about that other side of the equation. And I'm not naive to think that, that um, xenophobia doesn't exist in Canada, um, but sometimes we don't help our own arguments. It seems like there's a lot of these tough conversations to be had. And so we really appreciate you having the conversation with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, it's a pleasure. Yeah, thank you, Minister. That was fantastic. I think our our, our viewers and listeners are going to get a lot out of this. As I was telling Kara, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about these changes. So I'm delighted that you you came on and could could explain them uh, to Canadians. Thanks so much for watching and listening, and thanks as always to our incredible producer Meredith Martin. If you have any burning economic or housing questions, please feel free to reach out to us at missingmiddlepodcast at gmail.com. And we'll see you next time.